firstly, I'd say this is my first ever TAG conference. Uh, I'm not used to all this stuff, um, but um, I'm aware that some of you are dedicated um, TAG attenders, so I'll just say hi to all the diggers in the room and move on. Take a while? Pay for drop? Yep. Okay. Um, I am lucky enough to look after the scheduled monuments in London. I have a very straightforward job. I have to ensure that they're left in as good a state as we find them. Um, there aren't that many in London compared to the rest of the country. There's about 175, but they're a lot more lively because London is a lot more lively than, say, somewhere like Bodmin Moor. Um, <laughs> I'm continually endeavouring to ensure where I can that we oversee um, any works needed to the site. But I'm also very interested in how we engage people with these sites, how we use them to the best um, of our abilities, and how we can bring close people closer to them. My archaeological background is scientific, and preservation in situ is something that I've always had an interest in, largely because a lot of the time people <coughs> don't know what's meant by preservation, or in situ, or for how long, or will it actually work. Um, <laughs> I get very angry when people mention things like the Rose Theatre. Um, <laughs> we've seen this quite a few times, um, and so I am going to be talking about sites in the City of London. It's part of our theme this afternoon. And I want to look closely at the sites that have been preserved, the sites that have not been preserved, the choices that we make. Have we made the right choices? And as you can probably understand, I don't think we have always made the right choices and just to give some food for thought for um, the profession going forward with the choices that we'll make in future. Now, a lot of Roman London is standing quite happily in the landscape. You can see it. There are no issues um, about it. And so we do have fabric quite happily visible, preserved, that people can um, interact with. And this one is in the care of our good friends at English Heritage. You can see how some of the Roman archaeology has been modified. Much of the wall that you see is not actually Roman wall. Much of it is the medieval version of the Roman wall, often made from stolen Roman London. And you see, if you compare these two images, this is nice and orderly and Roman. This is much more chaotic and less Roman. It's how you tell what date you're looking at. Um, and yet they still stand in the landscape. Now, unfortunately, a lot of it um, is buried. This is what we still call the Roman Governor's Palace. We're not entirely sure if it's the Roman Governor's Palace, but it's what we technically refer to as a sodding great complex under Cannon Street Railway Station, <laughs> of at least 60 rooms with a garden and a fountain in Nymphaea. Um, but much of this is buried. There is relatively little of Roman London that you can see <coughs> if you walk through Roman London. Um, quite a lot is buried because the modern city of London is so dense and has such a high turnover of development. It's going to be very interesting to see how long the Bloomberg building will survive. The one that preceded it only went up in the 60s. I think the Bloomberg building, because it has been so carefully designed, it's very sustainable, um, it's likely to survive a lot longer than some other buildings. There's normally a roughly 30-year lifespan for buildings in the City of London, and so archaeology tends to be very buried. Now, being a classical city, it has been very well studied. This is one of my favourite books. This is a 1928 Royal Commission survey on Roman London, and it's a thick book. There was a lot known about Roman London in 1928, and it's where a lot of our information comes from. And a lot of our numbering actually comes from. And I think as we're being hosted by UCL, I would say that that 1928 survey was undertaken by Mortimer Wheeler, one of the early directors of the Institute of Archaeology. So he documented a lot. We've seen that some survives in the landscape. Some is buried beneath the landscape, but unfortunately, a great deal has been lost. Um, this is the Roman ship found at County Hall in 1910. This was, I suppose it's fair to say, it was lost through inadvertent neglect. 
people didn't know how to conserve maritime timber at the time. It was excavated, lifted. There are brilliant pictures of it being wheeled through London. Uh, but of course it decayed and collapsed. Much of the wall was destroyed deliberately. Some of this does survive, but as you see, some of it was destroyed in 1882. One of my favourite um, quotes with reference to actually the Billingsgate bathhouse, which was saved in 19... Uh, 46? 50. 50. Then, <laughs> is that less than 10 years later, much of the Roman governor's palace was blown up with dynamite um, in the 1860s. So things were destroyed deliberately, things were destroyed accidentally. In some cases, archaeologists made records where they could. This is the 1920s on the Roman waterfront, and these large forks at the front are the Roman waterfront, which is being cleared away to make way for new development. Some records were made. So archaeologists were scavenging information at the time, but a huge amount has been lost. When we think about what to save, what to try and save now, this is the kind of language that we use in the world of heritage protection. We're looking at the significance. How do we identify the significance of a site? We talk about things like local significance, regional significance, national significance, international significance. And these all have logical things that you can ascribe to them. And they're to do with things like rarity, to do with group value, to do with preservation. And then we look at value and we look at how people value these sites, what values people will put on a site. Um, Helen's mentioned that you get people that are really mad keen about Mithraea that turn up to the Mithraeum and they'll be the ones that see these having enormous significance nationally and internationally because Mithraea are found throughout the Roman Empire um, and it's something that they value on those grounds. Now, I don't think anyone in this room would doubt for a moment that Roman London has huge significance in terms of what survives and huge value in terms of its cultural history. Um, you're not the people I have to convince. Um, I will have to convince a difficult developer. Um, you know, I've had arguments with people laying broadband cables because I'm holding up the commercial development of the City of London by not letting them plough a cable line <coughs> through some Roman masonry that has been there for 1800 years. Um, but if you look at some of the remains from Roman London, not the bricks and the mortar, but things like the inscriptions, the cultural stories, the things that tell us of the people. So we've seen some of the Roman writing tablets um, and the Go on in, Go on in. Um, and some of the other details. We're now beginning to get much more information about the people, and it always comes down to the people. What do we learn about individuals? What do we learn about their stories? What do we learn about the history? And so things like the writing tablets from Bloomberg recently, um, we're getting to understand a lot more about the people in Roman London very early on. Now, admittedly, there don't seem to have been any women, according to those writing tablets. All the named people are men, so perhaps they just did without women for a while. Um, or perhaps it was that they weren't considered important enough. Now, we have our views on this, but it's still telling us part of that story, part of the history. And it's all part of the value that people place on London through the understanding of that history. And everyone has different things that they value. We've already talked about the scientific analysis of the human remains and learning the origins and the stories of how people have travelled and ended up in Roman London. So, many of these sites buried. Should we bother? Should we divert energy? Should we divert funding? Should we divert interpretation? Should we divert projects into archaeology if it's invisible? Should we concentrate on what can be seen in the streetscape, what people can interact with. This is the Huggin Hill bathhouse, a very famous site, and this is completely buried and not visible at all. This is Peter Marsden, one of our heroes, in 1958, excavating the Guy's Roman boat, which was seen very briefly 50 years later in a one-by-one -one test bed at the bottom of a five-metre deep hole in a road in Guy's Hospital. Should we worry about these sites if they are completely buried and invisible to the public? This is marked, by the way, by a very, very strange representation of a Roman boat. 
This is my most recent Roman scheduled monument in London. It's a brilliant bathhouse site and it's completely buried under a block of flats in Shadwell. So should we have bothered to preserve this? Should we have bothered to schedule this if it's going to be completely <coughs> buried underneath a block of flats? And the answer, oh dear, the answer to that really is yes. This is the Roman bastion in the uh, Merrill Lynch Bank of America building where even I struggle to get in there when I sworn in at my most annoying saying, but I'm the inspector. Um, <laughs> But the thing is, in 50 years' time, there may not be a Bank of America. They may not be in this building. It may be um, daylighted. This is lurking in the basement of Emperor House in Crutch Friars. It's been buried in there since 1980-something. This is going to come out into the public realm in the next couple of years. So it is worth it, because I'm afraid to say we need to think long term. We need to think about these sites and what they'll be doing when we're dead. I'm hoping that I won't have a heart attack in the next 15 years and die and I will work till retirement time. But I'm thinking about these sites in 500 years time and that's how I work and plan. And so the choices that we make now need to be a bit better informed. This is the Guildhall Amphitheatre and we saved that. This is the Roman waterfront and we didn't save that. This is the Governor's Palace and we didn't save that. This is the Courage's Timber Warehouse and we didn't save that. Catherine Stubbs didn't answer me when I asked her if we saved this. Did we save this? This is the sewer monument. We did save that? Yeah. We're not sure. We did save it? Still there? But you're beginning to see where we're going. This is the Bloomberg site, and we didn't save this. Um, and this is a horrible picture of the Clay and Timber building on Gresham Street, and we didn't save this. So what we're doing is, where we can, we're saving sites. Where they're robust and they will survive, we're saving sites. We're not saving them otherwise. This apparently is art. These are art. But these are separated from their context. You know, people are going to get the impression that Roman London is some walls from what we've saved. These are taken out of context and they are bunged in a glass case or they are bunged in a museum and they are barriers are put up to our understanding of these sites, what happened on these sites, sites how they performed. Admittedly, this seems to have been ripped off um, a funerary um, building, probably, mausoleum, something like that, and it ended up in a ditch. But if we are preserving sites that are nationally important, why are we separating artefacts from those sites? This is one of the most exciting finds that has been made in the world. Well, it was about 10 years ago now. This is the Draper's Garden Hoard. Straight away, all comes out. The artefacts are separated from the site and our understanding of what we are trying to preserve of Roman London is split from its context. So we're already making it more difficult for people to understand what was happening on those sites. I'm of the opinion that the physical connection is really important, and I've started being slightly weird about this. <laughs> this is the Roman Forum, all that's left of it. It's visible through a glass box in the basement of the hairdressers in Leadenhall Market. And if you ask nicely, they will let you go and look at it, but it's through a glass case. This is Billingsgate. You can, of course, go and see that, and if you haven't, then shame on you, um, and come and join us tomorrow. But this is the famous Roman wall in Bay 52 in the car park. And I'm afraid now that every time I take people in there, I make them pat it. I do, it's quite robust. Um, this was built 1800 years ago, probably by the army, probably by youngish lads from around the empire, from North Africa, from Dacia, from Romania. And it stands there and it's something you can touch. And the physical connection, I think, is really important to give people a very lasting sense of history. The Heritage Police. Um, yeah, well, you see, I'm the Heritage Police. I like to think I'm making an informed decision, but I know that I'm making a very selective decision, and it's largely based on can we save these sites. There's an argument that the people should be involved, should be decided, but th there is no such thing as the people. There are people that live nearby, there are people that work nearby, there are people that will visit, there are the people that like Mithraea. But it's 
very difficult to get a group of people to agree on what or how should be preserved. These people were adamant that the Mithraeum, these are the people that broke into the site on the something of September 1954, 17th, 18th. Um, I'm not sure this is what they thought, it is brilliant, but it's not what they necessarily thought about <laughs> what it was they wanted to preserve and how it should be preserved. You know, it's been on holiday twice mm -hmm. since then. <laughs> right. That's a run through of the sort of decision making that we need to be aware of. We need to be aware of the bias that we're introducing. We need to be aware that these sites have to physically survive, which is more difficult with the organic material. So some of the fragile walls, um, plank and timber revetments in <coughs> places like Bloomberg are difficult but not impossible to preserve. The timber Roman boat at Guy's is preserved. Those Roman waterfronts are amazingly robust. They would preserve. So we need to think a little bit harder because we are stewards. We're stewards of this. I've already said that we need to think about what's going to happen to these sites in 500 years' time. I might be sitting in a meeting having a tense discussion with a developer and I have to think about how this will survive, how it will be visible perhaps in 50 years' time, maybe even 100 years' time. I'm optimistic that when we start driving, the Roman wall in the car park, again, we'll see daylight once again. It's probably the most compromised piece of archaeology you will ever find. Um, but at the moment, we are stewarding it carefully until it can come out. The balance is currently wrong. We are preserving far too much masonry in isolation. We're giving an impression of Roman London that's very imperial, it's very administrative, We've saved bits of amphitheatre, bits of wall, bits of fort, bits of forum. The Billingsgate bathhouse is the only domestic thing we have. We've taken the people out of Londinium, and in future, we need to make sure that our legacy is more domestic, more human, more individual, and not, uh, I'm afraid, Howard's son in his Roman army suit with his big shield. Thank you very much.